episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Fire alarm on the C-46. 4,000 feet up and nowhere to go. We got the fire warning light. So how many buildings have burnt down? A remote town explodes into flames. And high altitude emergency. An engine fails in midair. Welcome back to Holy <laughs> Out of your hats, boy. This is what pilots in the far north do for fun in the dead of winter. <laughs> Buffalo Airways Captain A.J. DeCoast fights low temperatures with high adrenaline. I don't know, I'm not as haywire as you might think on the sled. I like to play around a little bit. AJ loves his sled. Uh, he's a fiend for the thing. I mean, he burned through a track in a year. I think he'll do about 120 miles an hour for how fast it'll go. Those are ideal conditions and stuff like that. So it rips pretty good. Just nine months ago, AJ and Candace were married in Yellowknife's landmark ice castle. And in the fall, Ooh, you're going wild for us. their daughter Amanda was born. The first time I held my baby daughter, it was just a feeling that I can't even describe with words. It was I wept when I saw when she was born. He's enjoying being a dad, that's for sure. Did you discover anything new? But marriage and fatherhood haven't tamed AJ's passion for powerful machinery. It's what pulls him to Buffalo Airways' vintage fleet of World War II piston pounders. For anyone who likes uh, Harley Davidson's as far as the, the sound that they make. Or going to, you know, stock car races, just the sound of the power. Sound goes right through your chest, eh? Yeah, it's an amazing feeling. I feel privileged to be able to do what I'm doing. AJ loves the thrill of being a pilot. I mean, what better airplanes to fly on than old World War II airplanes that may or may not make it to their destination. But on this December morning, a week before Christmas, AJ has to decide if it's even worth the risk to head out. He's got an urgent delivery, and the weather looks like it's taking a turn for the worse. The wind's blowing out of the northwest at 53 knots, so that's pretty quick. At 6,000, it's 57 knots. The mission? Head 500 kilometers southwest to the First Nations community of Nahanni Butte, home to only about 100 people. The town needs a new floor for their community gym. And they need it in time for their Christmas celebrations. The only way to get them that much wood is by air. The only plane that can tackle the job? The Douglas DC-3. While it's smaller than Buffalo's other planes, the DC-3 is just right for this job. Its big wings give it great lift, allowing for slow approach speeds. That means it needs a lot less runway to land on than most planes, as little as 800 meters, exactly the length of the airstrip in Nahani Butte. It's the only way to get that much wood to the community in the narrow window before Christmas. But the DC-3 isn't pressurized, so it can't fly as high as a modern plane. If a weather system is too low, AJ will be flying right in it. Today, there's some big, low clouds moving toward his destination. I don't think that it's going to be 
the conditions up there would be that bad. I think we'd probably climb up above it and be fine. AJ decides he can make it. But as the crew preps his plane, the bad weather hits Yellowknife. Yeah, the weather here is not actually that great. Uh, well, it's just uh, heavy snow right now. Yeah, this is definitely, I'd say, the beginning of the winter. But conditions still look good at his destination, so AJ's going ahead. Check 3007, taxi. Four runway, two five this time. Both clear to three. Clear on. Three take off. AJ and co-pilot Ian Bottomley want to leave the bad weather behind them. Just gonna start easing her down. She kind of wants to kind of ease down a little bit. But the storm clouds are following them, which could make landing this plane impossible. Meanwhile, over at Buffalo Cargo, manager Kelly Jurasevich has her own loads to get airborne. Well, we got two planes coming to you, my honey. You have frozen, and then all your non-food mail and your chips. OK. OK, bye, buddy. My love, I'm in the good books. And Kelly goes the extra mile and, and, and is really customer-based, and which is really good. And that's why people like her all through the Mackenzie Valley. Going to the plane to help push. But going that extra mile, whether it's being den mother to Buffalo staff or getting food and essential supplies to her remote customers, Kelly takes it all on, and the stress is killing her. After her husband quit Buffalo in the spring, Kelly considered following him out the door. Yeah, I want to get somewhere where we can have our farm again, because Juan and I were really happy when we did that. But she finally decided to stay with the company. I like the people up north, so I wasn't going to stay, but I changed my mind because I just couldn't quit. Now Christmas is coming up fast. Kate, you're good, Jeff. And the workload is overwhelming. Stop. This and that, the phone's ringing off the hook, people missing this, that shit, and I get stressed out, and first thing I do is start smoking. A pack and a half a day habit that recently sent her straight to the emergency room. They took chest x-rays right away. They found out that I have second stage emphysema. If I go into third stage, that's oxygen. I'm on a tank right away. My lungs can't heal. They will never get better. Seeing Kelly like this is, is very hard. She is a real mother to a lot of people. And to see her mom sick at any point is very hard. Good afternoon, Buffalo. And Kelly has even more on her mind. I can't believe you're going to be a dad any day. Oh, my God. Her son and daughter-in-law in Calgary are about to have a baby, oh. Kelly's second grandchild. I thought she was telling me she was on the way to the hospital. So tell her not to move. She needs to lay down and give me a couple of days here. She needs to deal with today's load fast Hello. so she can fly down to be with her family for the birth. Why does my cell phone die right in the middle of that? This family milestone is making her think hard about her health. I don't want, you know, my grandkids not to have grandma, or my kids not to have a mom, because I know what it's like. She died when I was seven years old, and I don't even remember her. When I think of it like that, then I just want to hit myself for, why am I smoking? Like, because I never want my kids not to have a mom. Back on the DC-3, AJ reaches the last leg of the flight. But there's a problem. Get over to Big Lawyer. The ice clouds are following them from Yellowknife, bringing low visibility and frosting up the windshield. Yeah, I'm gonna just dip her down a little bit there. Good to do. AJ tries to dip below the clouds. I don't know, my plan is it looked like it was going to work, but it may not, so. And to make it down to the Nahani airstrip, they have to see exactly where they're going. 
At a modern airport, navigation aids like lights and electronic beacons would guide a pilot in through bad weather. Onboard computers could sync up and land the plane automatically. Not here. Uh, we're kind of coming in uh, from this direction here. And uh, there's no nav aids in the handy view whatsoever. Uh, the strip's only about, I don't know, 40 to 50 feet wide, so pretty narrow. That's about half the width of a big city runway and a quarter the length. It's barely wide or long enough for the DC-3 to land. So AJ has to touch down right on the brink of the strip. He'll have to put it down on a dime. The weather's not super hot. There's uh, no approach in there, no runway lights there. So no approach lights, nothing like that. Hemmed in by mountains, AJ has to get on the perfect vector for the approach, guided only by his own two eyes. Right now, he can't see a thing. And we're in a big layer. Surrounded by ice clouds, Buffalo pilot AJ DeCoast is feeling his way down toward a narrow strip of frozen runway somewhere below his DC-3. If AJ can't see his target on approach, there's no way he can land. Yeah, I'm gonna just dip her down a little bit there. Good to you. But just when it seems like there's no chance. Yeah, the sun comes melt off all the ice for us. We uh, got a bit of it off there with the alcohol, but then now the sun will get the rest of it off for us. 721 DC-3, 20 miles to the northeast, heading to Hattie Butte in seven and a half minutes. But he still has big challenges below. He has to thread through the valley, then land on an airstrip that is barely long enough for the DC-3's minimum landing specs. Even worse, the strip is only half as wide as any strip where he's put down this plane before. I'm going to hug the hill and then over the field, and then to do the, kind of like an S turn. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Major airports have runways up to 3,000 meters long. This one is only a quarter of that. With zero room for error, AJ weaves around the hill, getting a visual on every inch of ground around the narrow strip. He needs to hit it dead right. You're just wanting to do everything perfect. You're wanting to slow down just at the right time. Uh, you don't want to be at all fast. You don't want to be at all slow, you just want to be right on. So you're just so focused. It's like we got the runway in sight. That's it. Yeah, that's where we're landing, man. Well... It looks even smaller than advertised. Now that he knows what he's dealing with, AJ will circle back to try to land. Which way are you going to approach from? I'm just going to make a right turn. You got the runway in sight at all? Uh, do, uh, do. AJ banks around and lines up, ready for the final descent. Go on, final searcher. Coming in at 76, 79. 72, 77. 68. 65. He hits it. Bang on. Any of your traffic, Buffalo 71 is down and clear. But the thrill of nailing this landing will keep him buzzing long after his wheels hit the ground. You get that adrenaline rush, and when it's all done, you sit there and just kind of vibrate a little bit like that. And uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of jobs that give you that feeling, eh? Nahani Butte has its new flooring and will have its gym repaired in time for Christmas. Girl. The crew takes off for home. Back in Yellowknife, Kelly is on her way out of town. She's dropped everything to get to Calgary to be with her family for the birth of her second grandchild. It's Henry. Where's Henry? There he is. But right now, her first grandchild, Sophia, has her full attention. Is he hungry? It's so nice to go and be with my family, just for a break, you know, away from here and stuff. And it, like, my little Sophia is so amazing. But there's one person Kelly didn't expect to find at home. Did you get any rest this afternoon? Somewhat. Her daughter-in-law, Carla, has been released from the hospital. Her contractions have stopped, for now. Mama to play. She can play Twinkle Twinkle for me. 
Away from stress, Kelly hasn't needed a single smoke break. Her daughter Stacy wants Kelly to quit for good. She's booked her an acupuncture appointment tomorrow. One of the few quit smoking methods Kelly hasn't tried. Unless she actually does stop smoking, then she probably won't be here for a lot longer. And, you know, she won't be able to watch Sophia grow up, watch her grandkids grow up. But even in her daughter's apartment, Kelly isn't really away from the stress that feeds her habit. Oh, God. Evening, Buffalo. They're just in a hurry, don't give a shit. A crisis at the warehouse sends Kelly straight to her cigarettes. Hopefully tomorrow, for the first time, maybe she can actually have a chance to stop smoking, and that would probably mean everything to me, because to have her here, of course, is the most important thing to me, because she's my mom. Back in Yellowknife, Buffalo General Manager Mikey McBrien gets the call no one there ever wants to get. Uh, we got maintenance code Delta on the left engine, so... Uh... OK, let me get this straight. You're calling maintenance code Delta on the left-hand engine? Yes. Code Delta, the most serious level of mechanical trouble. The crew on one of Buffalo's trusty 30,000-pound C46s is trying to make it down with a dead engine. I don't know how long he's been running with a, a bum engine or no engine. Engine failures on the 46 are rare. Now, with only the 2,600 horsepower right side engine keeping the big plane in the air, pilot Arnie Schrader and co-pilot Scott Blue have everything riding on a single prop. On well, a two-engine plane, you know, you don't have any options if the under engine fails. This is a, a test of someone's merit there. This is the extreme. The crew has to steer to compensate for a plane refusing to fly straight and struggling to stay aloft. Imagine blowing a tire at speed on the highway. If you blow a tire, it's going to want to drag to the right. So what you have to do is you steer the airplane three to five degrees into the good engine, and you're going to have to adjust the rudder pedal just ever so slightly as well. Now, they've got three lives riding on getting this 30,000-pound warhorse on the ground with half its power gone. Okay. Arnie and Scott guide the wounded bird onto the runway. Crisis averted. Safely on the tarmac, the crew relives the failure. The left engine gave us a couple of backfires. It gave us one, and then about five minutes later, it gave us another one that was a little bit more violent. And then all of a sudden, it just started backfiring continually. This is like a machine gun, coughing, barking, spitting. They're just lucky that their plane wasn't weighed down with freight. Thankfully, we were empty. If we've got a full load, it doesn't really uh, perform all that well. Christmas is less than a week away. Towns up and down the Mackenzie Valley are depending on both of Buffalo's C-46s to get their last-minute presents and holiday food. They can't afford to have one become a hanger queen. Well, I'm going to open it up and see how a quick look, yeah? Engineer Adam Smith investigates, searching for a clue to what killed this engine in midair. I think we might have dropped the valve seat. Well, one hell of an intake leak here. They find a massive leak on an intake valve. There's only one solution. They'll have to disconnect and detach the entire engine off the wing and bolt on a new engine and get this plane back in the air to meet the Christmas rush. The next morning in Calgary, Kelly heads to the acupuncture clinic. The hardest part about going out today and doing acupuncture was the unknown. Like, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Acupuncturist Kelly Murphy tries to ease Kelly's worries. I'm just going to, with an alcohol swab, just clean the areas that I'm going to put the needles in. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Acupuncture was bizarre than hell. Dr. Murphy isolates energy points that relieve stress. The other goal, hit energy points that target Kelly's taste buds, make her hate the taste of a smoke. With her face looking like a pin cushion, she tests the theory.
Yeah, it tastes a bit different. Not actually horrible, but. I was never a believer in this stuff, but you know, I can see how it'll work for people. See you, thanks a lot. After removing the needles, Kelly heads home. And in at least one important way, the treatment has helped. I don't know, I just feel different. I feel like a lot of stress is off me. But with work just a phone call away, how long can the new stress-free Kelly really last? Early morning in Yellowknife. Oh, and Buffalo owner Joe McBrien is already putting out fires. I got a shitload of freight over there. Yeah. And we, we were trying to do it with one airplane. And that other airplane breaks down today. I'm in deep shit. I'm going to have 15 ton of shit sitting over there in the ramp. No airplanes to move it with. Buffalo Joe needs his C 46 in the air, delivering backed up Christmas freight. If not, he's losing money, and the recession is already hurting him. But the new engine isn't ready. Do you want to? I'm going to look here. I say the whole situation kind of sucks. The C-46 engine is designed to power the plane's generator, but for some reason, it's not connecting. So you can put the generator on board. They turn to one of their spare engines as a reference. Finally, they narrow it down to a small missing part. This coupling. We need that coupling to uh, get the generator to work. They race to install the replacement coupling. This plane is half of Buffalo's C-46 fleet. But it's not ready to fly cargo until Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader takes it for a test flight and pronounces it fit for service. Facing the holiday onslaught, they need that to happen now. 2,000 kilometers south in Calgary. What the hell happened? The Fort Good Hope Northern Store is a blaze of fire. <gasps> That's just savage. Fort Good Hope, a regular stop on Buffalo's Valley Run. A suspicious fire fueled by exploding propane tanks is consuming the town's main store, the major source of food and supplies for an isolated population of 600. Buffalo flies vital cargo there every week under Kelly's watch to people she considers close friends. Buffalo's first concern is the massive load in the Yellowknife warehouse. 2,000 pounds of it destined for the northern store tomorrow morning. Now there's nowhere for it to go. OK, I'm going to tell you what you have coming then. Kelly has to jump back into work mode, diverting the load to other towns. Can you take the capacity of their produce and things? You can't, eh? Kelly has made friends with all her far-flung clients up north, and she pleads with them to take the orphan goods. You know what? You guys are so amazing, Lindsay. I'm going to call you right back and find out what the hell we can do. OK, I'll call you guys back. Kelly okay, makes it back. work, but there's a deeper problem. There's no food in the community. This is a very, very bad thing. She fears the town's smaller remaining store isn't enough to keep the people fed. We need somebody to organize this and get their asses up there to help this community out. And I don't know who the hell it's going to be, but something has to happen, and something has to happen fast. Next morning on the Buffalo Ram, Kelly's rejig load is ready to go up the Mackenzie Valley. And finally, there's a plane to take it. Good day. Pull them down, rock and roll. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna go for it today. The weather's looking a lot better up at that end of things, so. After a successful test flight yesterday, Arnie has decreed the C-46 is back in action. Today, its final stop will be an emergency delivery of groceries to Fort Good Hope. We were the only source of 
you know, supplies going in and out of any size. And obviously a lot of the town supplies and food and household items burnt up and were non-existent anymore. AJ, along with his co-pilot Scott Blue, and Adam as the flight engineer will fly it up the valley. Filled with holiday freight, the 46 is loaded to its maximum capacity. The first delivery stop on the Valley Run is Delaney, about 500 kilometers northwest. For 400 kilometers, it's a smooth flight. But as they prepare for the descent into Delaney, there's low cloud over the entire region. The crew will need to approach low, under the clouds. Then, a bigger problem. We got the fire warning light flickering on number one engine. All of a sudden, everybody's wide awake trying to see why this big buzzer's going off. There are two massive tanks of aviation fuel in each wing. And with engines suspended on each wing, an engine fire is as serious as it gets. If it gets into the fuel system, then I mean, there's, you know, about 4,000 pounds of fuel on each side of, uh, of the airplane, so. If it can get past that far, well, if you allow it to advance that far, then you haven't really got too much of a, of a chance. If you let the fire get away from yourself, you're gonna burn the wing off, and while you're flying around, you know, you're 4,000 feet up, and you've now lost one of your wings, uh, that could be a bad day. AJ and the crew know exactly what they're supposed to do. Cut off fuel to the specified engine and isolate any fire before it can spread back to the fuel tanks. If a fire is allowed to spread and those tanks ignite, the explosion could blow the 46 right out of the sky. You have to react quickly. If it was an, if it's an actual fire, it may be a matter of seconds before you have the, uh, the chance to, to stop the fuel to that, to that engine. This is the same plane that landed with the dead engine. This time, it's fully loaded and the low cloud means they'll be coming in close to the ground. I was concerned that with the weather being as low as it was, if we had shut down that engine, that we might not have been able to go around. If the initial approach isn't perfect, the power of one engine won't be enough to lift this plane back up for a second attempt. We really don't want to shut down that left engine. But can a pilot afford to ignore a fire alarm? On the first leg of a mercy mission, we got the fire warning light flickering on number one engine. Captain and new father AJ DeCoast is racing against a possible fire in the engine of the C 46. I'm just having a look here and I don't see a fire yet. That's good. But I'm having uh, just a double check, make sure we don't have anything. I'm confirming, eh? With no visual sign of flames or smoke, AJ is betting on a false alarm possibly an electrical short in the engine. If it was a very light load, then we may have just shut it down right away and taken zero chance that it was a false indication or, or a real indication. With the C-46 fully loaded with Christmas care packages, AJ would rather not risk landing on just one engine. But if there is a fire, things can go bad fast. It's only a matter of time. I mean, metal, magnesium, everything burns. Once you get the oil tank burning or hydraulics, you may lose the ability to control the airplane. I'll just be watching out for any developments there. AJ performs like a machine in that kind of situation. He knows the drills. He doesn't even really think about what he's doing. You don't want the lights, or you just call for him if you want? I'll call for him. Understood. He just played it cool, and I played it cool with him. and. You know, put your fears aside and deal with the situation ahead. AJ and Scott guide the 46 into their low approach to the Delaney Strip. 
They've got to put it down right on the button. I was relieved step one, I guess, was when we landed the airplane and it was on the ramp, we were shut down. I thought that we did quite well. No fire in the engine, a false alarm, just as AJ suspected. Engineer Adam Smith gets to work looking for the source. See that? It doesn't take long to find. This uh, piece of lock wire right here was grounding from the top of the fire probe all the way over to the firewall, causing our light to go on and our bell to go off and make all kinds of noise. Right. Make us think we had a fire. All it was was a little piece of lock wire. Good news. The problem was rectified and we could continue on and uh, you know finish our mission for the day. Their next stop, Fort Good Hope. Uh, good morning. We're inbound from Delaney. We're 20 back through 2,100, surveying landing in six minutes. The crew is bringing vital food and supplies to the fire ravaged community. Then, as they fly over the town, they see the charred remains of the store, smoke still rising into the air. It leaves only one thought on their minds. You know, what can we do to help, you know? Relieve some of the stress on the community and make sure that they had everything they needed. Heavy. On the ground, the rubble of the store still smolders. Just days before Christmas, all the store's employees have lost their jobs. You know, it's been, uh, it's been a difficult week for, for everyone. And the Northern store was much more than just a place to buy groceries. It was home to the community's only postal outlet. So yeah, they lost all their, they lost all their presents that they were getting and that they were gonna get in. That goes back a long ways. It's really quite a loss, you know, and even people from other communities feel it. Like many isolated northern communities, Good Hope was established as part of the fur trade by the Northwest Company in 1805. I mean, that's where the name Fort comes from. And they are a fort, and, and, and these stores were, were all came in the north as a, as a trading post. So you'll hear the old timers say, I gotta go into the post which really means town or I got to go to the fort. The Northwest Company merged with the Hudson's Bay Company in 1821. That original trading post evolved into the modern Northern store. Today, once again, under the banner of the Northwest Company. As AJC 46 leaves the smoking remains behind, it's clear that the town will need more than one delivery of groceries to salvage its Christmas. I was up there, I just talked to the people who, who uh, I met up with and, uh, you know, uh, showed my sympathy for them and, you know, offered a helping hand. But uh, they're strong people up there and they seem to manage through it quite well. But right now, AJ's just ready for his long, draining day to be over and to be home with his family. Home sweet home. Is that baby? How are you? There hasn't been an instance yet that has made me think about what it is I'm doing, you know, with respect to having a new baby. And uh, I'm not saying that that couldn't happen, you know, one day at a time. Early the next morning at the hangar, Mikey gets an urgent call. Hey, Kelly. Worried about her friends in Fort Good Hope, Kelly wants Buffalo to step up. I just kind of took it upon myself to ask Joe and ask if people would help them out in the community. I want to give these guys a deal because this is really sad what happened. Although the recession has forced Buffalo to cut every needless expense, Mikey and Joe are ready to donate space on their planes to help. You don't want to make 
money off somebody else's back when you're down. You can give a lot because they've given you a lot. So there's a lot to give back. They decide the first step is sending the person who deals with the locals every day. Our main priority was to get Kelly up there because Buffalo will be a big part of their rebuilding. That's good to see you. Huh? You too, sweetheart. That means Kelly has to head back up north. Well, when I left Calgary, it was very difficult. And I knew I had to come back. But, and of course, the baby wasn't born yet, so that really stressed me out. I love you. But my kids are so understanding and caring that they make it easier for me. Kelly wants to come to the rescue of Fort Good Hope in time to save their Christmas. But the question is, how? Buffalo cargo manager Kelly Jurasevich is heading off to help a town in need. She's made a tough decision, leaving her family in Calgary with her new grandchild yet to be born. It was really difficult to leave my family. But Kelly's compelled to help a community in crisis. The remote Northwest Territories town of Fort Good Hope is devastated by the loss of its main store. Hey. Kelly is here to find out how Buffalo can help. You guys doing okay? Uh, it's calming down a little bit. It's been yeah. Working. Darcy Ryan, the Northern Store's manager, and his wife Kim are two of Kelly's closest friends out of all her Northern clients. They're hit hard by the destruction of their store. Unbelievable. Yeah. A store Darcy had spent over a year renovating and rebuilding. Over here was the post office and our tills. You can sort of see the remnants of our customer service tills. And, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears have gone into this store over the past 13 months. Yeah. It's, uh, it's heartfelt to see that gone. Right? A lot of hard work. It's freaking horrible. You can still smell it, eh? Yeah. That smell. Next door, at Darcy's house, they relive the night of the fire. Holy, look at the freaking, look at the bellow of smoke. Like, it's huge. It's almost like the freaking nuclear bomb went off, for it crying out loud. It went up forever. The cause is still under investigation, but there's no question about the impact. Kelly is more determined than ever to help. By the time Kelly lands in Yellowknife, she has a plan. The owners of the Northern Store have donated toys for the kids in Good Hope, but they need help flying the presents up from Yellowknife in time for Christmas, a chance for Buffalo to step up. If you've got something, you can well afford to share it. You don't need to keep it all to yourself. We supplied space on the aircraft for donations to go up there, and we donated ourselves some uh, turkeys to go up there. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes we are the turkeys, sometimes we give turkeys. And that sends Kelly on another mission. Turkey's aisle 10. Along with AJ and her brother Jack, she's on a turkey hunt for Fort Good Hope. Six, seven. The care package will provide Christmas dinners to the neediest families. Turkey, so. Oh, yeah. Kelly plans to head to Good Hope to help deliver the Christmas load in person. Okay, AJ, thanks, buddy. See you later, Kelly. But before she can head there, she'll have to return to her most stressful place. So welcome back to work. Yeah, welcome back to holy The next morning, she's back at the warehouse. This one, that one, and that one, we're done. Okay, perfect. Prepping for the first of two C-46 runs up the Mackenzie Valley. This is just ridiculous. Why in the do we have 652 and now I'm at 964? The chaos of the cargo bay is driving her back into her old habit. It's just the stress of working here. I mean, holy And stress, they say, triggers my smoking. Well, I guess I better find a new job in order to quit. And today, she's got an extra headache, making room for Buffalo's special delivery to Fort Good Hope. Yeah, and make sure the turkeys and the toys, however you can manage it. A trip that you? Kelly will make in person, if they can fit it all on the plane. What skid are we going to put this on? It's got to be a small skid. Fort Good Hope. 800 kilometers northwest of Yellowknife. 
a community still reeling from a fire that destroyed their main store, taking away the town's food and toys a week before Christmas. Now, three days ahead of the holiday, help is on the way. Two Buffalo Airways C-46s are bringing special Christmas donations. No one is more eager to see the planes land than the store's manager, Darcy Ryan. Two planes coming here today. We look forward to seeing those, getting some of this uh, product off the planes. It's a rare event on this tiny airstrip. Both of Buffalo's massive 46s together. Capable of a combined payload of 27,000 pounds, delivering a huge care package in time for the holiday. Personally, for me to go up to Fort Goodhope and bring this stuff, I felt honored that actually Joe and Mikey chose me to go up there and do this. Like, it was great. But there was a personal sacrifice. Kelly had to miss the birth of her new grandson, Benjamin, to get here. But she's on a rescue operation. Besides another emergency delivery of supplies, there's Christmas dinner for the town's hardest hit families and special treats for kids who lost presents in the fire. Now we have a lot of toys and groceries since there are some families that are struggling and this will help out. So it's real, it's gonna be a real happy Christmas this year. Everyone was so happy. And I think that's important with Buffalo. And Joe, of course, sent it all up for nothing, too. And it's, it's a part of Joe that lots of people don't see. And it's a very good side of Joe. After a very tough week, Kelly and Buffalo are helping Fort Good Hope recover. But heading for home, Kelly still has to face her own problems. With her emphysema and trouble quitting smoking, Kelly has to decide, can she really keep both her health and her job? On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Pilots under pressure. At 150. I've never seen oil pressure that high. Have you? Oh. And things are ready to blow. It's gonna blow up. Rookies under pressure. Two young pilots face their first checkouts. Cargo under pressure, and Janelle blows up. <laughs> <laughs> 